Paul had come here from Korea. He essentially got kicked out of Thessalonica, Korea, and he came here on his own. Um, he was waiting for uh, Timothy and Silas to come. And uh, as you can imagine, you know, by himself, he's walking these streets in Athens, and he sees these great monuments, these, these temples to these gods. Um, right to the right of to your, to your left, you see that temple there. And just looking at, at, at Paul and his passion for the gospel, his, as usual, Paul went to the synagogue. He came to the synagogue here in Athens and uh, dealt with the Jews and the God fears. But not just those, but he also dealt with the people in the Agora, you know, people, the Gentiles who didn't know the, the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, and he reasoned with them. And uh, as uh, Acts says, he went there every day and reasoned with them. So uh, we don't really know how long he was here. You know, some people say a week, maybe longer, maybe until. Uh, Silas and Timothy came to uh, rescue him, I guess. But uh, he eventually ended up here. Right? He ended up dealing with philosophers, Stoic and Epicurean philosophers, and he ended up at this hill, where it was a civic place where they would deal with religious matters. Uh, I think I, Dr. Watson said earlier today, Athens had lost some of his luster. It wasn't what it used to be. Uh, but you can imagine, you can still see these images. You know, it still had some uh, air to it. It was the center of philosophy, is where philosophy, you know, became something. It's where Aristotle, with Plato, Socrates, all those you know, big intellectual minds came here. And Paul stood right here in front of these men uh, with that with that heritage, uh, and he proclaimed the gospel. Uh, and not just that, he used the surroundings, right? He used the the temple of uh, the shrine of the unknown god, uh, which hasn't been found, by the way. But I'm pretty sure it's there somewhere. I have faith in it. Under Some, something. Under something. One of these houses. <laughs> <laughs> and he used that, uh, which kind of gives us a way of, you know, how we have to approach the gospel sometimes too, right? Uh, meet people where they're at, kind of adjust it to them. Uh, but what what kind of resonated the most to me is that he didn't water down the gospel. You know, he may have used their techniques, um, their critiques, their rhetoric, but the gospel message stayed the same. Um, and I'm, about to, I'm going to read the passage or his speech exactly that way get a full on to it um, but just try to take note of it um, how he still says God is God is our creator he is God of our world. Jesus he said God became man through Jesus Jesus died resurrected and he is the hope for salvation that message is still there uh, through all the rhetoric uh, he still did not water the, the gospel message down so let me read the passage to you guys I'm gonna try to be in character see if so I'm using a more loose translation, not anything too crazy, just something that a little more um, conversational, I guess. It says, Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines. And one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I am telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. And he is, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies, satisfies every need. From one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God, and perhaps feel their way to him and find him though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times. But now he commands everyone to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed and he proves to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead now the original speech may have been a little longer than this some people even say 15 minutes um, but Luke here kind of summarizes pretty well what the message is and I kind of kind of looking at it I figured out or noticed three things right? he says God is our creator for one thing he acknowledges man's problem with just sin but then he shows God's plan for man, this salvation. So what was the result of this? You continue reading in Acts, 
some left, which may have been the Stoics because they thought the body was a prison, so the resurrection for them was something not even considered. Some shelved it for later, which could have been the Epicureans because they were more open to these new ideas of religion and gods. But some believed, which is kind of the important part of this whole thing, right? Some, some did believe. Paul planted a seed here. And how does this apply to us today, right? Well, I believe we are part of Paul's legacy here. Out of all week we've seen these ruins of these great civilizations um, of the past, and even of our history, you know, in uh, just ruins of that. But we stand on the shoulders of these men, of John, of Peter, of Paul. And that message that he preached here has been entrusted to us now. That message of the gospel, that God became man. He died on the cross and saved us from our sins from judgment. So, having been entrusted with that, 2,000 years later, the message hasn't changed. It's still the same. It is as powerful as ever. So I, I end with this. Where would you make that stand of the gospel? What would you do with that message that you have in your hands now? Your history or legacy that we've seen here? Where is your Mars Hill? 